Okay, uh, good evening or good afternoon, everybody. Today I want to talk about uh, open, open internet. Um, there's a lot of open around at the moment. There's open data, there's open government, open protocol, and I will talk about the open intranet. Uh, but that sounds a little bit contradictory, isn't it? Because an intranet, by definition, is something inside organizational boundaries. It's not open by definition. But we all know that the intranets uh, we have to work with in, in those days are really boring. They don't work, they are broken somehow, the search is really bad, and we are somehow feel much more comfortable in the web, at least me. I don't know. Let's see, why is that? Why is the openness not yet uh, uh, in the intranet? So if we um, think of uh, intranets nowadays, they are somehow similar to castles in, in former days. They are closed. Because they, of course, we are, we are living in, in, a, in an age where there is kind of a, a feeling, a strange feeling. The web is, 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 is a place which is, is probably still not, not clear. It's, it's dangerous. Uh, so we really would like to keep it away somehow from our internet still. But I want to bring in a new idea of openness. Open doesn't mean the opposite of being closed. That's very important, I think. And if we, if we look at system theory, they've taught us that there is this kind of openness we, we, we can examine, for instance, in living organisms, is kind of a structurally coupled openness. That's something else. Then the openness, just having opened the door, is something else than being structurally coupled. Uh, it would take me a little bit more minutes to explain that completely, but just to give you an example. This fly, which is probably walking over a painting of Rembrandt, of course, is open to the painting. It can touch the painting, it can even take away some molecules from this painting. It's open to it. But it's not open in a sense that it's structurally coupled um, to the um, cultural sphere of human aesthetics. It's not possible for the fly to understand Rembrandt's work because it's not structurally coupled. And that somehow reminds me on how the internet is compared to the internet, how nowadays it's not structurally coupled. Because we have a different picture of how human beings or uh, users should interact in an internet than they do on the internet. It's not structurally coupled in that sense, and also on a more technical level, if we talk about data structures, it's very different how we handle data in the internet than we do it nowadays on the internet. And the linked open data comes up. I will come back to it a little bit later. Okay, so from a user's perspective, it's really uh, exhausting to live on the internet. We have to go to the internet very often, go to Google or another search engine, type in something, find it out, copy it, go back, jump back to the internet, paste it there, and so on and so forth. You always have to jump around. It's not uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way connected to each other. That's exhausting to my, uh, at least to my uh, sense of understanding. So if you look at this little gadget deer down there, and I'm, I would say I'm a gadget deer, um, I really would like to have the same functionalities uh, in, on the internet as I have it today on the internet, on the web. Um, for instance, I'd like to have better search. I'd like to have more integrated views on the information uh, which is scattered around the different sources. I don't want to jump forwards and backwards, copy, paste, and so on and so forth. That's exhausting. I want to have integrated views, and of course I want to do all these nice uh, things uh, on the internet as I'm used to it already on the web which is about interacting with the information. I want to give feedback, I want to rate it, I want to have it as a learning system, actually, uh, how it's already on the web out there. So, we are obviously in two roles. We are in the intranet mode, we are in the internet mode, and we always have to switch forth and back. So, now I come to the good news. I think there's already a lot of uh, good examples out there 
where we can see that the internet has started to open up to the web. So slowly, but they open up, like here, the city walls have opened up a couple of uh, centuries ago. So I think the internet will do the same in the near future. So first example, I think we know all of that. There are jokes, there's weather reports, there is stock exchange rates, rates and stuff like that on the internet. But it could be a bit better, to my opinion. So let me give you a couple of examples. For instance, enterprise mashups. That's something which can be really helpful. If you think of a uh, CRM system, a customer relationship management system, which is connected to social networks like LinkedIn or others, it's possible to enrich the information on the internet from inf information from outside. Or just think of all these open innovation projects which were developed in the last uh, few months. A very exciting one, I think, was this from British Petrol, PP. They received over 40,000 ideas how to clean up with the oil. Of course, only a few dozens were realized, but still, they've opened up to the web, to the community, and gained a lot of information and ideas from the outside. Also, content enrichment is something which is really important and, and exciting. Just think of all the uh, situations you're in when you start typing something in your content management system, in your wiki or something, so you're on an editor. And what would be if there would be a nice little widget which helps you to gather information from the outside which fits somehow to the content you're uh, um, actually writing on at the moment. So it, it, you, you receive a lot of background information from the web. So since it's all about money, how can we uh, convince somehow enterprises to open up a little bit more to the web? So the, probably one of the most uh, famous examples was uh, a Canadian gold mining company which uh, published 400 of megabytes of uh, data about geological survey, and they gathered $3 billion out of a contest. Companies were asked to find out where good places to uh, pull out some gold, and it was worth $3 billion, these 400 megabytes. On Netflix, contest was another example. So that's a movie recommender engine, which was improved by more than 10%. After three years of work, a lot of different teams around the world tried to improve this recommender engine, and finally they did it. So that's just another very good example how you can uh, re uh, receive something from uh, pulling out some data on the web first. Okay, so to make a conclusion out of this talk, first of all, I really am very thankful uh, being here, because TED is something which is really inspiring to me. Same with me, 5 o'clock in the morning, probably I'm um, still, well, not, but 3 o'clock in the morning watching some TED movies. And Tim Berners-Lee, one person who really inspired me, he was starting here on TED, not here in Vienna, but somewhere else, on TED, talking about opening up the data sources, and the governments all around the world started to do that. And hopefully now enterprises also do something similar, because I'm pretty sure if all this data will be connected, then we are able to solve some bigger problems we are uh, at the moment have in this world. Thank you.